Now I'd like to uh, welcome our special guest, Professor Robert Percival. He is the director of the Environmental Law Program at University of Maryland Law School. He is the author of a, a widely used environmental law case book. Uh, he served as a visiting professor at Harvard and at Georgetown University Law Center. He has been a Fulbright scholar. He has worked extensively in China, and he's teaching in our summer program uh, the Comparative Environmental Law course, focused on China and the US. And um, in his many years earlier, earned his BA at McAllister College and his MA and JD degrees from Stanford Law School. So. Uh, last year we had him here talking about his work in China, and today he's going to be presenting on a new topic. Uh, it's called Environmental Law in the Last Place on Earth, and we've been seeing his slideshow from his trip to Antarctica. So please join me in welcoming Professor Percival. Hi, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I've always wanted to visit Antarctica, and I was always trying to figure out a way to get my wife to agree to come along with me. And the stars finally aligned themselves this year. It was our 30th wedding anniversary in January, and it turns out she's an incredible Ernest Shackleton buff. She's read all the books about the famous journey of the endurance. A so hundred years ago today, Antarctica was considered the last place on Earth, the last unconquered, unexplored place by man, and there were four major um, uh, Antarctic explorers. Uh, Amundsen is the one who first made it to the South Pole, um, but um, Shackleton actually was quite an amazing character because he was the one who had previously, two years before, come closest to making it to the Pole. He was only 97 miles away, but he realized that he was overextending his supplies and that the, some people would die on his expedition. So he made the heroic decision to turn around. Then after uh, Amundsen had already made it to the pole just before Scott made it, and Scott unfortunately died, having realized that he was the second to the pole, Shackleton decided that he wanted to be the first one to make a complete crossing of Antarctica. And that's what started the endurance uh, expedition 100 years ago. Uh, unfortunately, there was very heavy ice in the Weddell Sea and ignoring warnings when he had been on South Georgia Island uh, about the ice, they continued on. Their ship became trapped in the ice uh, in the spring of uh, 2015. They had to overwinter there, and ultimately, uh, in the summer of 2015, uh, well, November, December 2015, the ice crushed his ship. But heroically, his men in lifeboats, he directed them to sail to Elephant Island, where they stayed there for several months when Shackleton went ahead in another boat and finally was rescued. And every single one of the 56 men on his expedition survived. So it's an incredible story of, of human endurance. And uh, National Geographic decided to sponsor an expedition to celebrate the 100th anniversary of Shackleton's trip by essentially going the same sort of route that Shackleton did, uh, including landings on Elephant Island and South Georgia Island. So my wife was very excited about this, and it gave us a chance to go to Antarctica. I was so impressed by the extensive care that's been taken to preserve the Antarctic environment that I decided to research uh, how the, our system of treaties and laws protects Antarctica, and uh, then got the idea of contrasting this to what's going on at the North Pole, uh, as there's a big scramble for development there. And this is the spot on Elephant Island where Shackleton's group first landed. Um, it's quite an amazing story about the history of uh, legal regimes to protect Antarctica. Back in the 1950s, several countries, seven countries, had made territorial claims to Antarctica. And there was a fear that this could lead to conflict as many countries had overlapping claims, as that map shows there. Um, at the time, the scientists proposed that we declare 1957 to 1958 the um, International Geophysical Year, 
and devote it to exploration of places like Antarctica. The United States very shrewdly used the International Geophysical Year to establish the first base on the South Pole, directly on the South Pole. It's called the Amundsen-Scott Base in honor of the first two people to reach the South Pole. And even though the US was making no territorial claim on Antarctica, the fact that they had established a scientific research base on the South Pole gave them more credibility when President Eisenhower on May 3rd, 1958, proposed that the nations of the world who were involved in Antarctica research get together and hold a conference to see if they could reach a treaty to govern uh, the use of Antarctica in the future. And this conference was incredibly successful from October 15th through December 1st, 1959. It led to the negotiation of the Antarctic Treaty that has uh, been incredibly successful at protecting Antarctica. One of the key features of the treaty was that the countries all agreed to suspend their territorial claims and to treat Antarctica as a scientific research park that would be protected against uh, all military activities. And uh, the first article of the Antarctic Treaty says Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. So the militaries of the world are barred from Antarctica. Um, the 12 signatories to the Antarctica Treaty, um, the ones in the middle there, those countries, now have special status, and the treaty provides that it was supposed to be every two years that the nations get together to exchange information and discuss the future of Antarctica. Now they actually do it on an annual basis. And in fact, today there are, uh, in addition to the 12 countries, 38 other countries have accepted, acceded to the Antarctic Treaty uh, for a total of uh, 50. 17 of those 38 countries now do substantial research activity in Antarctica, so they're allowed to have consultative status as well. So today there are now 29 consultative sta states that are allowed to meet every year uh, to play a role in shaping the future of Antarctica, and then the uh, rest of them, the other 21, have observer status at these meetings, uh, just the last meeting was held uh, last month in Sofia, Bulgaria. Uh, the next meeting will be held next June in Santiago, Chile. And uh, after the negotiation of the Antarctic Treaty, there have been a series of other conventions and protocols adopted, the most significant of which that we'll talk about is the Madrid Protocol on the Environment that was adopted in 1991. There also is a convention on the conservation of Antarctic seals and the conservation of marine living resources and the like. Um, actually, the convention, the Madrid Protocol, this shows you all the bases that different countries now have in Antarctica. Uh, most of these stations don't have people that overwinter. Uh, it's estimated that the height of the summer, the population of Antarctica at these bases, maybe a few thousand. Uh, at the biggest US base on McMurdo Sound, uh, there are about 200 people during the summer and about 50 who overwinter. Since it's at very close to the South Pole, uh, they have six months of darkness uh, throughout the year. And that's the, the uh, Amundsen Scott base at the South Pole. Now, in the early days, um, just as our environmental mentality at the time was in a lot of places, they didn't pay very much attention to waste disposal. And the McMurdo Beach base was one of the worst. I had the opportunity to interview a lot of the scientists who had overwintered at some of the US bases. And they said it was really kind of an environmental disaster, especially because the US <laughs> had the bright idea. It wanted to provide electricity by having a mini nuclear power plant. The thing never really worked right but it generated a whole lot of radioactive waste. At one point, they had to ship away 112 barrels of radioactive waste that had been generated by this reactor. But their disposal of other waste was really pretty appalling, and the thing was like a giant waste dump. And uh, Russia was no better at their, their base either. Uh, 
At the time, I had been working in the 80s for the Environmental Defense Fund, and one of my colleagues, a scientist at EDF, Bruce Mannheim, had been our person who attended all the Antarctic negotiations. And Bruce, this is actually a tribute to Vermont Law School, his first encounter with law is he got his MSL from Vermont Law School as a scientist who didn't want to get a full law degree, but he then went to Knight Law School at Georgetown while he was working for the Environmental Defense Fund, and he would always have these great tales about how he would show up at the Antarctic negotiations in a suit and tie, and Greenpeace would show up in penguin costumes to hold a demonstration, and he said he liked that because it made him feel like he had more credibility in negotiations. Well, he had this bright idea that he heard that the National Science Foundation, which ran the U.S. base at McMurdo, uh, was planning to build a garbage incinerator. And they hadn't really even looked at what the environmental consequences of that would be. So he decided he would like to bring a lawsuit claiming it was a violation of NEPA because they hadn't done an environmental impact statement. And so the question was to be litigated, uh, do the activities of federal agencies in Antarctica, the National Science Foundation, uh, are they subject to NEPA? He got a major DC law firm to represent EDF pro bono, because he wasn't an attorney. They filed suit in a decision by District Judge John Garrett Penn. He held that NEPA did not apply extraterritorially, and therefore there was no required environmental impact statement. Bruce was convinced the decision was wrong. He really wanted to appeal it. But the big law firm that had represented it said, well, we lost the case. We're not going to get any attorney's fee for our time. We've already put a whole lot into this case. Uh, we're not going to represent you on appeal because we think you'd probably lose. In the meantime, he had just gotten his law degree from Georgetown. I had just left uh, EDF to join the faculty at the University of Maryland. And Bruce calls me up and says, what should I do? And I said, you're a lawyer now. Handle it yourself. He said, would you help me? I said, well, I'll provide you know, advice and, and stuff, but do it yourself. And he did. He took it to the DC Circuit, and he won. In a decision written by Judge Mikva, the DC Circuit held that, well, it's true, that there's a presumption against extraterritoriality of US environmental and other laws. Here, the purpose of the presumption doesn't apply, because the purpose of the presumption is to keep US law from interfering with the law of other sovereigns. But because of the Antarctic Treaty, there are no other sovereigns in Antarctica. The countries have all agreed that they're going to suspend their claims of sovereignty, and that they're essentially going to regulate themselves, uh, and therefore, given that the decision to build the incinerators being made in Washington by the National Science Foundation, you have to do an environmental impact statement. And that really had an impact. In interviewing some of these scientists, uh, they said that the other factor that really got the basis to clean up their act was that Greenpeace had the bright idea to fly down to Antarctica the congressmen that were in charge of the annual appropriation for the National Science Foundation. One of those congressmen was Congressman Al Gore when he was in the House. And when they came to Antarctica and saw what a mess McMurdo base was, they said, we're going to you know, start monkeying with NSF's appropriations if you don't clean up your act down here. And that really had an impact in getting them to clean up their act. The other thing that fortunately happened Unfortunate, briefly, for the Antarctic environment. An Argentine cargo vessel that had been supplying some of the bases, the Bahia Paraiso, uh, ran aground and spilled some oil in Antarctica. And everyone realized this could be a huge environmental disaster because the weather conditions there are so harsh that you don't have the normal capabilities that you might have to contain oil spills. And this inspired the um, International Maritime Organization to adopt a special protocol for Antarctica to declare it a special area where the normal really dirty, heavy bunker fuels that ships use, that ships in that area can no longer use those fuels because of the danger of oil spills. And one consequence this had 
was a lot of gigantic cruise ships were cruising off the coast of Antarctica. And they no longer could do so because they weren't designed to build, to uh, use the special light fuel that had to be used for environmental reasons now because of the International Maritime Organization. About the same time, Australia mining interests got interested in the idea of mining in Antarctica. And so they started drafting a convention on how mining would be regulated in Antarctica. And they thought this would be a way of paving the path to riches from the Antarctic environment. But the rest of the other countries of the world were so horrified by the notion of mining in Antarctica that they started negotiations on what became the Madrid Protocol on protection of the Antarctic environment. In 1991, uh, this was adopted. It uh, entered into force in 1998. And it expressly bans mining in Antarctica until the treaty is reopened 50 years later. So Greenpeace considers this an amazing victory for the environment uh, as a result of, it. and the scientists I talked to said NSF just absolutely hated Greenpeace. They couldn't stand uh, the fact they were always complaining about what they were doing at the base. But they have to give them credit because they played a really major role in getting the Madrid Protocol uh, adopted. And it says specifically, any activity relating to mineral resources other than scientific research shall be prohibited. Um, now, in Natalie's uh, talk uh, last week, she uh, mentioned the 2041 organization, which is devoting attention to the notion of let's carefully be ready for the possibility that the Madrid Protocol can be reopened, uh, and they have this countdown clock. Uh, actually, the treaty, the protocol specifies that it will be reopened 50 years from the date it entered into force, so the really relevant date's probably 2048, but it's certainly important what the 2041 organization is doing to lay the groundwork for keeping Antarctica unspoiled. Uh, there are also provisions in the Antarctic Treaty that allow the designation of certain historical sites. Scott's Tent, for example, which is now buried under all kinds of snow. Uh, the, you may have seen the PBS special, the Penguin Post Office. It's a site we visited at Port Lockroy. It's a, a famous, they've now turned it into a museum of British Antarctic activities. That's designated as one of these uh, protected sites. And the treaty gives each country uh, who's a party to it, the right to inspect what other countries are doing at their Antarctic bases and requires them all to exchange information. And everyone says it has worked remarkably well in um, keeping everyone honest and ensuring that uh, they very carefully manage their environmental impact. So McMurdo Station today, which I didn't visit, it's way south, we went essentially to the Antarctic Peninsula, is a much cleaner place. They did build this uh, giant dome and operate it under there for a while. This is the brand new, it's only a few years old, uh, structure that they've set up. And they have special uh, supports underneath it that they can adjust the height of it depending upon the way in which the ice cap is moving. Because, of course, Antarctica is the coldest, windiest, uh, driest place and also highest average continent, continental uh, space on Earth. Um, when we went to the uh, IUCN Academy of Environmental Law Colloquium in New Zealand, my wife joined me afterwards and we spent a week traveling, drove south all the way to Christchurch and when we were getting on our plane we ran into the U.S. Antarctic uh, program site there. That's what is used to supply the U.S. bases. They fly from New Zealand. And right across the street from it, they have this wonderful International Antarctic Center where you get to uh, get, be in a simulated Antarctic snowstorm. You get to ride around on the training course they have for people to teach them how to drive these vehicles over the ice there. And ha has anyone seen the film Antarctica? A Year on Ice, it's, it's really extraordinary. It was made by a New Zealand filmmaker who spent several years uh, overwintering in Antarctica. Uh, 
And it really shows you what happens 12 months of the year, half of which you're in total darkness. Uh, one of my best lines in, in the film that I thought was one of the coolest lines, they mentioned how there's still, the sex ratio is such that there's far more men than women there. And they interviewed this uh, woman scientist who had overwintered there. And she, she said, there's a saying among the women of Antarctica, the odds are good, but the goods are odd. <laughs> Anyone who wanted to be away from civilization for six months of the year must have something wrong with them. But she ultimately ended up marrying one of the other people uh, who was stationed there. The Chinese now are very active in Antarctica. This shows the bases that uh, China now has in Antarctica. And you now actually, tourism is the main, uh, tourism and scientific research are the main activities. You can now fly to the South Pole. I didn't realize this until I discovered that this Swiss billionaire who was on the trip was planning to fly to the South Pole as his next trip. Uh, it costs only $47,000, but as you can see from the screen gap, uh, they're already full up for just the first flights in December to the South Pole. Um, now, there, one of the things I was surprised at is how well the tourism industry regulates itself in Antarctica. Here's some statistics on tourism. You can see that most of the tourists come from the United States, followed by Australia and the United Kingdom. This is the latest data from last year, 36,000. Um, about two-thirds of those actually land on the Antarctic continent. The rest just sort of uh, dry, uh, sail by on larger uh, vessels. And um, most of these tourists go to the Antarctic Peninsula, which is actually one of the most interesting features of Antarctica with respect to uh, marine life and also uh, mountain scenery. Uh, but there's this group, the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators, that virtually everyone who sponsors commercial trips to Antarctica is a member of. And they have regular meetings where they do things like, at their last meeting, they decided to ban tourists from using drones to take photographs in Antarctica until we can determine you know, how it can be safely done. Um, at, on the National Geographic ship we were on, they had these very detailed guidelines about what you could and could not do and where you can and cannot go when you're on land trying to uh, photograph wildlife or watch wildlife. Before you leave the ship, you have to have your uh, boots decontaminated and then they will have placed these cones that show where the tourists can go, and you're supposed to stay 15 feet away from the wildlife, unless they approach you, but of course, uh, lots of the wildlife, especially the penguins, there would always be a little delegation of penguins that would come out to, to greet us, and uh, some aggressive sea lions as well. Now, while we were down there, there was a lot of publicity for the fact that three vessels were illegally fishing for uh, Patagonian toothfish, the Chilean sea bass. And the New Zealand Navy tried to board their ships, but they, were, they then put up the flag of Equatorial Guinea, denied them permission to board. New Zealand then was told they could board forcibly, but the seas were too rough, and so they did not board. They took extensive photographs of the illegal fishing, alerted Interpol, and hoped that this would mean that they would not legally be able to offload their catch. Now, I always wondered what happened to them, and I've been following this, and yesterday's New York Times has this amazing story about Sea Shepherd. Uh, the, it's believed that the ships were owned by a Spanish organized crime syndicate. They kept changing their names and um, putting up different flags in order to avoid any scrutiny. But Sea Shepherd, for one of these most notorious boats, spent 110 days, traveled over 10,000 miles to an area off the coast of Africa. And finally, when they realized they were going to be caught, they ended up scuttling the ship deliberately. Uh, sea Shepherd was, at one point, they collected things like the illegal nets they had used and the like. And it's now hoped that. Uh, the perpetrators will be prosecuted. The Spanish government has expressed interest in bringing criminal charges against the owners of the ship. Uh, I urge you to read this article. It's like a four-part series in the New York Times. It's just terrific. But it also sort of shows how there are now these sort of 
public-private partnerships now. Uh, sea Shepherd claims that all it, everything it did was legal in trying to interfere because uh, the treaties expressly encourage help from private parties in uh, ensuring that violations are detected and enforced. Now turn to the Arctic. This is really where the action is today. Um, one of the great things Natalie did in her talk was she talked about how climate change is affecting the Antarctic, how the, some of the ice shelves are melting and breaking off, and while if it's an ice shelf that's not over land, it's not going to contribute to sea level rise, it's going to contribute to those glaciers disappearing much faster on land, and there could be truly catastrophic sea level rise in Antarctica as a result. In the Arctic, the polar ice cap has shrunk far faster and more dramatically than anyone had forecast. If you look at the uh, previous Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, the state of the polar ice cap today is, be, is smaller than what they said would happen about 2030 in their earlier forecast. Now this is having big implications, in part because it's opening up the possibility of commercial exploration, uh, exploitation of a lot of those Arctic resources. It's going to open up shipping lanes, among other things. Now, how is the Arctic regulated? There is no Arctic treaty like the Antarctic treaty, uh, but uh, environmentalists have been pushing for one. We do have this group called the Arctic Council that includes the countries of Canada, uh, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States that meets uh, with indigenous groups and the like. Uh, here's a list of the permanent the member states, the permanent participants, and various working groups to try to coordinate policy for governing the Arctic. Um, and just earlier this month, Russia and the US, as members of the Arctic Council, signed on to a ban on commercial fishing in the Arctic. Uh, this is actually something that would have happened a year ago, but the U.S. was protesting the Russian invasion of Ukraine at the time. But it shows that there's concern that before we allow uh, fishing fleets to go in there with the diminished polar ice cap, we should at least have set some ground rules for how commercial fishing is going to be regulated. So there's a moratorium for now on commercial fishing uh, in the Arctic. Uh, at the same time, the International Maritime Organization, which doesn't have a really good history of concern for the environment, has adopted what's called the Polar Code, which was largely motivated by fears of ship accidents in Antarctica. But the great thing is that it also applies to Arctic ships. And it has very specific requirements for ship design, and preparedness for emergencies and accidents, uh, which uh, me is kind of an example of how uh, concern for protecting the Antarctic environment has been leveraged to protect the Arctic environment as well. Uh, there's also a parallel private organization, the Association of Arctic Expedition Cruise Operators, that has its own code for what tourists can and cannot do. Uh, uh, when they're exploring the Arctic on these vessels, much like you have in Antarctica. Um, now, what conclusions can we draw from this? One aspect, uh, for several years, Semin Yang and I have been promoting the notion that um, law is changing in some dramatic ways, that the traditional distinctions between international and domestic law and private and public law are starting to blur. And I think you see that in connection with protection of the Antarctic environment, where private parties are playing a role as well. The cruise operators all know that if this is going to continue to be an attractive place for tourists to visit, they have to be very careful in such a harsh environment to ensure that their activities don't cause harm to it. Groups like Sea Shepherd are arguably playing a more important role than individual countries in enforcing some of the restrictions on commercial activities in the Antarctic uh, as well. Uh, my former student, Mark Nevitt, and I have decided to write a law review article. It's going to be called Polar Opposites, What the Arctic Can Learn from the Antarctic Treaty System. 
He's currently the commander who's in charge for the US Navy of environmental compliance for the Mid-Atlantic region. He's based in, in uh, Norfolk and is about to uh, move up to the Pentagon. And uh, since the military is very concerned about what goes on in the Arctic, he's focusing on uh, the Arctic part of things and I'm focusing on the Antarctic in our article. Now if you just look at a map of the world, the Antarctic Treaty applies to everything below the 60th parallel. And that makes sense. That's where all of Antarctica is, including the Antarctic Peninsula. But you couldn't do that, really, with the Arctic, because all of Greenland is above the 60th. Most of Russia is above the 60th parallel. Most all of Scandinavia is above the 60th parallel. Big difference between the two, of course, is Antarctica is a continent, a landmass. Whereas Arctic areas are ocean with frozen over most of the year parts of it. So as a result, the operative legal provisions for the Arctic are largely governed by the law of the sea. That's one reason why the US had pushed so hard to try to get the law of the sea ratified so that we could be a full member uh, able to influence and take part in the dispute resolution mechanisms of the law of the sea. Just before the 2012 election, John Kerry, when he was chair of the uh, Foreign Relations uh, Committee in the Senate, told the Republicans, I want to ratify the law of the sea. The former Republican president supported. The US Chamber of Commerce supports it. The US military supports it. All environmentalists support it. And I will promise not to hold the vote before the election so you won't get into political trouble. We'll hold it after the election. Well, what happened was some Tea Party senators started gathering signatures, and they succeeded in getting 34 signatures saying, from Republican senators saying, we will never vote to ratify the law of the sea. So since you need a two-thirds majority of the Senate to ratify the law of the sea, it joins the long list of treaties where virtually the entire world has signed and ratified them, but not the United States because of that requirement. It's also a reason why uh, in the future, uh, as is the case with uh, so many of these agreements and trade agreements, they won't be submitted to the Senate as treaties for ratification, but rather as executive agreements that won't require the two-thirds vote. Well, you can see that they're, they're already identified areas for potential oil exploration in the Arctic, and the U.S. has now gone ahead and given Shell permission to do its exploratory drilling in the, in, uh, the coastal areas off, in the uh, areas off the coast of North Alaska. Uh, Shell has already sunk something like five billion dollars over a decade to try to get this product off the ground, but to try to get production of oil in the Arctic off the ground. BP, by contrast, originally was interested in drilling the Arctic, but it said, way too risky. It's such a harsh environment, no oil company should be drilling there. It's true that the waters are not nearly as deep as in the Gulf of Mexico, but the weather conditions are much, much harsher. And that's been one of the problems that has uh, delayed things for Shell. Uh, but so, you know, drilling is going to proceed in the Arctic. Uh, just on Sunday, Vladimir Putin uh, announced that he was endorsing this new Russian strategic doctrine on maritime issues. And no, he said it also adds the Antarctic as a region for strategic interests for Russia. Who knows what that might ultimately mean, but you could see Russia uh, trying to push things in the Antarctic uh, if uh, this has any impact. So we concluded our trip. We landed uh, on Elephant Island, saw the site where Shackleton's men had spent much months when he went off in the rowboat to find help. And he landed ultimately on South Georgia Island. Uh, one of the cool things about South Georgia Island, they put an observer on our boat the minute we entered South Georgia waters to make sure that uh, we were following all the regulations. And the uh, observer proudly declared that they had recently caught uh, one of those illegal fishing vessels. And he said, guess what we did? We, we figured, well, we've seized it. We could put it up for auction, but maybe some other criminal syndicate will buy it. We blew it up. 
and created another you know, little reef, artificial reef for marine life. Um, we landed uh, in the area where Shackleton actually ended up on the wrong side of the island from where the whaling station was. So he had to hike in the middle of winter over these mountains and we did the last leg of that journey. And you can see down there, Stromness, that's the ruins of the old whaling station where he finally got help. Um, and we then went to Great Viken, the capital of South Georgia Island, the only real town on South Georgia Island. And it turns out Shackleton is buried here, not because he died right after the trip, but years later, he was starting another expedition. He had a heart attack when they were in Great Viken Harbor. And they started to ship the, his body back to his wife in England, and she said, just leave it down there. So they buried him in Great Viken. And one of the great things National Geographic had done, they recently, in the last couple of years, discovered a case of Scotch whiskey that had been left behind in the snow from Shackleton's expedition. So they got a distillery in Scotland to reproduce this recipe and took it along with us. And we all had to take a sip. But you were supposed to first pour a little of it on Shackleton's grave. Now, I didn't realize until I saw this National Geographic photo, that's me. Notice everyone else has their, uh, I have my camera in my hand, but I'm actually sipping the scotch. I didn't give Shackleton his full blue. I did pour a couple drops on his gravesite, but the scotch was too good to pour all of it uh, there. So um, stay tuned. Uh, there's going to be a lot of controversy, probably primarily over the Arctic first. Given that we have this 50-year window created by the Madrid Protocol on commercial exploitation of the Antarctic, the, you can see why it's happening in the Arctic, because it's much closer to developed countries. Uh, they've already identified oil resources there. The Arctic, Antarctic, is much further away from populated areas. It, uh, it is likely that it's going to take a lot longer before it becomes uh, even economical in anyone's dreams to uh, try to extract resources from there. Today, it's actually estimated that for shells drilling in the Arctic to be profitable, the price of oil would have to be $75 a barrel. Just yesterday, BP announced that they're adopting a long-term financial strategy where they expect low oil prices like today's 50-some dollars a barrel to continue indefinitely into the future. So it looks like it's crazy what Shell's trying to do, but uh, they do want to kind of feel like they've gotten some return from the massive investment they've already made there. As the ice melts in the Antarctic, as it's done in the Arctic, uh, it's only likely to see in the not too distant future that there'll be some people clamoring that there are these great ant uh, untapped resources in the Antarctic. For now, though, it seems like the biggest resource of all is promoting tourism. Thank you. They're allowing them to drill the first part of their exploratory wells until there's this, they're required to have uh, this vessel that has material to cap it if there's a leak. And they said they can't drill, drill any deeper than that, so they can't actually get to the point where they'll strike oil until that vessel gets back from Portland where it's being repaired because it had an accident on the way up. But once that vessel gets there, presumably they'll be able to drill their exploratory wells. Wouldn't it be great if they find the oil isn't there? Oh, we've got a friend that works in McMurdo. And so oh, she what? says there's, a, there's like a bar there for all the scientists. You know if there's any like liquor rights in the walls or like, <laughs> <laughs> like um, that? I, from what I hear, there's a lot of drinking down there. <laughs> and well, it's, it's also interesting because the historian who was leading the tour of the old whaling station in Grit Viken talked about how because they wanted to avoid fights among the people working at the whaling station, they totally prohibited alcohol there. But what you can still see today are the secret stills that they had, and they made some of the most toxic rot gut alcohol because people just couldn't deal without. There have been some incidents where there's been fights 
and you know they've had to ship someone off uh, because of uh, somebody you know went crazy and you know, almost killed someone and, and the like. And I assume alcohol you know, you know it might contribute to that, but the, they also are apparently screened very heavily to make sure you have the kind of personality that can stand being in six months of darkness with only a set number of people around. You mentioned Robert Swan, and I wanted to go on an expedition with him when he lived off renewable energy on Antarctica that cost $30,000 and our budget here for our show. But I was wondering what was your experience getting to and returning from, because my friends that were on that expedition, they were in this really hardy former Navy ship, but they encountered the storm so badly bad that someone got a cush and someone broke their leg, and the light was flash flashing in the cockpit capsized. Wow. But they didn't capsize. But wow. it was a horrendous. Well, return. the worst part is the Drake Passage. You know, we yeah. we flew down, flew down to Buenos Aires, then to Ushuaia, which actually was we spent our honeymoon in Patagonia, and so we were trying to find the place we had stayed at in our honeymoon when we were in Ushuaia. But then you leave from Ushuaia on the ship, and the worst part is crossing the Drake Passage, which is just in, you know it's near Cape Horn, uh, and it's just so unbelievably uh, rough there usually. It was completely, you know, not rough at all for us. It was completely calm, so we had the best passage. But the National Geographic Lindblad ship has these extenders that they can put out and deploy that will slow the ship down and prevent it from rolling as much as it otherwise would, and those were really effective. But lots of people still had to be on seasick medicine because it could get rough. It did maybe only once during the trip. We were incredibly lucky. They said that they'd never been able to land people on Elfin Island because it's normally so rough there, but we were able to land both there and on Point Wild. When you were mentioning about the Russian Maritime Code, you were wondering what that might mean for Putin's intentions. You said with regard to Antarctic? Did you mean Arctic? No, no, they, they expressly added the Antarctic uh -huh. as a region of strategic importance to Russia. So who knows what that means? It may just be his bluster as a way of getting people freaked out. Uh, it was mainly directed at you know, what's going on in the Baltic, that, uh, but the press was careful to note that he also specifically mentioned Antarctica. Yeah, sure. I, a couple of years ago, I heard the Russians were attempting to drill into what they called the sealed lake. And I, you know, at that point in time, they had, were in the process of trying to sort of have they had a number of mechanical issues. Have they continued with that process, or do you know that? I haven't heard much about that, but there's some incredible, gigantic lake underneath the ice, and I know they've been trying to take like cores for purposes of scientific research. Uh, I don't know what the status of that is, but there's you know on our ship. They had divers that would go down almost every day with these National Geographic underwater cameras, and then they'd show us the video of the un incredible underwater, you know, a sea life. It's just amazing in conditions that harsh that you could have such a rich, thriving uh, sea life environment. Uh, it was, you know, these gigantic sea spiders that have this special antifreeze for blood and stuff, just really amazing. Mm -hmm. What was the thing that was most magnificent to you or you weren't expecting or was overwhelming as far as its beauty or pristine, the animals, the eyes? Well, both the incredible abundance of wildlife and sea life and um, the incredible beauty of the ice. You know, you have these gigantic tabular icebergs that at one point there was one 17 miles long that suddenly appeared in the middle of the night. The ship had its own ice master, whose job was specifically to do nothing but look for ice. And that you know, delayed us a couple hours because we had to sail around it. But the ice is just so amazingly beautiful as we would you know, go up to these icebergs and our zodiacs. And we actually got to do some kayaking. And while we were kayaking, uh, we turn around this iceberg. And all of a sudden, I see this gigantic killer whale just jump straight out, out of the water. Uh, it just, you know, events like that were just, you know, awe-inspiring. Um, I can't remember if you maybe listed it, but is Russia <coughs> signed on to the Madrid Protocol? Yes, yes, yes. So, 
um, you know, there's no chance that they'll start mining. Right, right, right. That would be very uncool. That's not and then this whole thing has worked pretty well. And I think one of the reasons it's worked so well is because it's so hard, it would be so hard. It would be like you know, shell times four to try to you know, develop resources down there given the harsh environment. So that may be why it's worked so well, that everyone's content, that we'll all agree that we're not gonna mess with this for now. Um, I noticed North Korea is one of the non consultative states. Do they show up to the meetings and offer? Uh, uh, good question. Uh, I mean, it means they, uh, uh, they can observe if they want. I don't know if they're coming regularly to those meetings. Given everything that you presented, what do you think is the greatest environmental threat to the Antarctic region at this point in time? Well, you know, given that tourism is about the only activity, it could be a threat. But I was so amazingly impressed at, you couldn't even pee on Antarctica. And they said, if you gotta pee, you gotta get in the Zodiac and go back to the ship because and urination on Antarctica is not allowed. Whoa, that's pretty cool. Uh, so it could be tourism, given that you know, 30 some thousand tourists are going there every year, but given how seriously they think, well, there was one incident we saw. If any of you saw the slideshow beforehand, I had the shots of like 300,000 penguins looking at them from atop a ridge. And the day before, they actually, have you seen that um, film, what's it called, the, with the disappearing ice, where they've set up these fixed cameras Jason, in various Jason, yeah. Jason ice. yeah, yeah. One of those cameras was there, and it photographed someone from a private yacht just walked through all the penguins, which is like the biggest no-no. You can't do that at all. And you know, the National Geographic people were saying that yacht is going to be in really big trouble because of that, and that's a good thing why those cameras are set up so you can observe that. So it could be tourism, but for now, tourism seems to be really well regulated there. What about, what about the poaching uh, 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 fishing activity? Well, um, you know, it, it seems, it, I mean, it's happening, but, you know, people are aware of it's happening and they're gonna take some action. The problem seems to be that no individual country, it just wasn't worth it to New Zealand to be the one that volunteered to get those ships. So thank heavens we have Sea Shepherd. Of course, the Japanese have been doing, you know, whaling down there in violation of the International Whaling Commission uh, requirements and they were taken to the International Court of Justice by Australia and New Zealand, and Australia and New Zealand won. So they suspended their whale hunt for a year. They're now relaunching it uh, in a much more restrictive way. That they, The reason they lost in the International Court of Justice is the court ruled that it didn't qualify for the exception to the commercial whaling moratorium for scientific research. And now they're trying to make it look more like it is for scientific research. Um, but I suspect they'll probably get hauled back to the International Court of Justice if they do that in any substantial way. Uh, so climate change is affecting the Arctic pretty seriously. Um, what are, by 2041 or 2048 when the Madrid Protocol comes back up, what is the, what is the Arctic going to look like? Is it going to be much easier to develop or is it going to still be harsh? It will still be a harsh environment, but there'll be a lot less ice. Uh, I mean, the scientists would tell us at each stop you wouldn't believe you know, how much of the ice has melted from when we were here a year or two ago. And that's gonna have some real consequences because you know, it's like you know, the Greenland ice cap over land, Antarctic ice cap over land, except for the ice shelves, some of which had already dramatically broken up. Uh, if those things melt, then it's like 20 foot sea level rise and a real disaster for the world. Uh, presumably that will make it easier to develop resources in Antarctica, but then you still have the, the problem of, it's not very close to you know, Scandinavia or Russia or other developed countries like the Arctic is, so there's you know, not the, uh, it, it still won't be as easy to get to those resources. Well, thank you. Thank you.